I don't know what else to tell you guys. It is becoming an increasing problem so much so that we're hearing it at our academic meeting. The Board of Dermatology, the medical board, nobody really knows what to do because we're getting overwhelmed with these complications. If you have a potential blindness from filler, how would you reverse it? And if they can't answer that question, we run out the door and seek treatment elsewhere. Hi my beauties, my name is Dr. Stephanie Kappel and I'm a board certified fellowship trained cosmetic dermatologist in Newport Beach, California. Today I wanted to do a video to recap the amazing things that I learned at our recent academic meeting this last weekend in aesthetics. This was a meeting that was only for physicians only. It was a collection of world renowned experts and leaders in dermatology and we learned a lot of cool science, new genes being discovered which can translate to skincare and targeted actives, new devices and techniques and protocols in laser medicine and in devices to keep our skin active and healthy and rejuvenated over a lifetime. So I want to be the liaison between the medical community and you guys. And this is straight from an academic meeting that just occurred yesterday. So it was my honor and privilege to actually speak at this meeting, but I'm actually going to give you information that I actually learned myself learning from world renowned experts. The first thing that I wanted to cover are scientific discoveries that have been made in the skin. So clock genes, there was a lot of talk about clock genes. You may be hearing about them in the future online and in published literature and on vlogs and beauty blogs and what clock genes are is they encode certain proteins in our skin cells that allow our skin cells to know the difference between day and night. Circadian rhythm and circadian different processes that happen in the skin cells and your skin cells actually know whether it's day or night and they function accordingly. So at night we play offense and at daytime we play defense. The reason is is because as we are sleeping there are genes that are encoded and they transcribe and translate different proteins that accumulate during the day and they get degraded during the night. So that's how the cells know whether it's day or night pretty much. There are these genes that are expressed in skin cells. They're also in the central part of the brain and in the back of the eye, there's opsins. There's all these different kinds of proteins, but basically your cells know whether it's day or night and they'll have function that gets upregulated or downregulated, whether it's nighttime and we're sleeping or we're awake during the day. Things like cellular renewal, cellular proliferation, DNA repair, secretion of enzymes and secretion of sebum happens while we sleep. And that's why we always say when you're gonna exfoliate, it's better to do it in the morning if you're only gonna do it once a day as opposed to doing it morning and night. You would think that at nighttime, that's when you're gonna take off all your makeup and all the skincare products and sunscreens that have accumulated throughout the day, but it's actually in the morning where it's more important to exfoliate because your skin cells are on overdrive, renewing themselves, proliferating, thickening up that stratum corneum layer, excreting sebum and secretions that you wanna kind of exfoliate off in the morning to have a fresh, clean slate when you apply your skincare products. So I thought that was very fascinating. I'll take a deeper dive into the subject if you guys want me to because this is more of a basic science lecture and I thought this was really cool but anytime we learn new signal transduction pathways new genes that are encoded new processes that the cells do it's always good to think of like targeted active ingredients in our skincare they're gonna upregulate the skin cells to act and behave in the healthiest manner and to act and behave even younger to make our skin look more rejuvenated so I thought that was very fascinating I'll do a deeper dive video if you are more interested in hearing more about these clock genes and all these really cool proteins and signal transduction cascades that have been newly discovered in the skin so the next topic that I thought was really cool was a lecture given by Dr. Paul Grimes, who is a world-renowned melasma and vitiligo pigmentation specialist. She was actually one of my dermatology attendings when I was a resident at UCLA. She was actually talking about different approaches to melasma and hyperpigmentation and how big of a role autophagy plays in melasma. So for those of you who don't know, autophagy is when your cells kind of degrade themselves and it's a programmed cell death. And that's what apoptosis is. And it sounds like a bad thing, but it's actually a positive thing because when cells are just functional or they're not functioning optimally or they're old and tired and they're not doing you know what they used to do whether that's secretion of melanin synthesis of collagen synthesis of elastin cellular renewal then they kind of have this programmed cell death which is a very scientific elite phenomenon that happens to keep your skin cells healthy it's out with the old in with the new and they get replaced by newer rejuvenated higher functioning cells and so melasma is now focused on in the melasma disease process there have been a lot of discoveries on signal transduction cascades and active ingredients that can upregulate autophagy. So that was a really cool thing that I learned because usually in melasma, we're focused on breaking down the melanin and slowing down the melanocytes, which are the pigment producing cells from making melanin at too fast of a pace. I thought that was a really key point that I wanted to bring home to you guys as well. And I could do another video on that, taking a deeper dive if you're interested in hearing more about it. So another treatment that was getting a lot of attention at this meeting was PRX. So we don't technically call PRX a chemical peel. It is a low to no down 
downtime peel where you don't really get an exfoliated process. And what PRX is, is it's a combination of TCA and hydrogen peroxide and kojic acid that has been used and studied by many to show a benefit with respect to the texture and tone of the skin. So it's a lot more user friendly if you have low downtime or you don't have much time on your, your downtime calendar. So a lot of the treatments at focused at this meeting was more on like limited downtime, but packing a punch with efficacy, but not really having a time where you're going to not be able to go to work or have a social life. We we're kind of steering away from the more downtime to the less downtime procedures and PRX was one of them. Third treatment that's getting a lot of attention at this meeting was pico toning. Pico just means a trillionth of a second. So a picosecond is a very fast laser. This is a pico laser behind me. This is a pico way, which is from Cineran Candela. Again, I'm not sponsored. I just love this laser. I don't get paid to talk about this laser. I honestly, as always, my content is non-sponsored and I just recommend what I love and I think is best for my patients. And if something new comes along that's even better, I have the freedom to not post what I was posting before and post something new that I think is newer and better. And that's why I've always been non-sponsored. Plus I think it's unethical to be sponsored as a physician. But anyway, that's a whole other story. This Pico laser behind me is a 532 1064. So it's two different wavelengths that target different things, melanin, hemoglobin, different aspects of the skin to treat brown spots, red spots, melasma, hyperpigmentation. There's a mode on it called Pico toning and it's a different low downtime targeted therapy that targets hemoglobin and melanin and it's great for improving the texture tone of like the face and the neck especially if there's changes like on the neck like poikiloderma of savat for those of you who don't speak the dermatology language that's a ruddy muddled, muddled appearance of the neck and chest that we get from years of sun damage the pico toning laser is really really great for that it's a very low downtime there's actually little to no downtime you can sometimes get something called petechiae which are these little tiny like red spots like almost little areas of a hemorrhage but for the most part there's no downtime to pico toning we use it in our office it's not really new but it's getting a lot of hype and attention recently because we're changing with the settings and a lot more devices have it as an option. So this is my Pico, but there's also a PicoSure that's by Sinusure that's a 755 nanometer wavelength laser. There's lots of different types of Pico lasers. So Pico just means the speed of the laser, but it can have different wavelengths that targets different things. The main attention was on Pico toning and that it's a no downtime, really quick and easy lunchtime procedure that people can get. And of course they're saying about six to seven treatments to get the best results, but the results were very impressive. My colleagues and I were talking about how impressed we are with their results. That was another treatment that got a lot of hype during this meeting this last weekend. So number four, another treatment that got a lot of attention was the endolift for acne scars. So there was a physician who flew in from, I think she was from Tel Aviv, and she was lecturing on this amazing endolift. It's radio frequency. It's kind of similar to something called Thermotite, which I used to use back in 2017. And that was actually a great treatment. It's kind of like a similar treatment, but basically she was getting really impressive results with acne scars. She also was showing before and afters combined with fractional laser resurfacing and CO2 and other chemical peels as well. So as with anything, acne scars usually requires different modalities of treatment to target different mechanisms of action to the acne scars. But I was very impressed with her endo lift before and afters. So another technique that was talked about is phenol peels. Phenol is a very, very strong, deep peel. And in the past, it's been used for a very deep, very aggressive chemical peel. We used to have to have cardiac monitoring. You'd have to mix it with different things like crotron oil, like different aspects to it. But the way that phenol peels being used that was presented at this conference with many new indications was really interesting and it doesn't really require cardiac monitoring. I remember the meeting, the Masters of Aesthetics meeting about a year ago, they were talking about really great results with before and afters for under the eye phenol peels. Now I don't do that as a cosmetic specialist, but I know some of my colleagues do. They didn't talk about that at this meeting last weekend, but they were talking about phenol being used for different acne scars and also for an entity called idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis. For those of you who don't know what idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis is. Dermatologists love to give very complex long names to very simple things, but they're just those little white spots that you kind of get on your arms and your hands or anywhere on your body when you've had extensive sun damage. They look like little islands or macules of vitiligo, but it's actually just little white spots and it's areas where the melanocytes have stopped producing melanin. So historically, the only real treatment we had for that was the Fraxel Restore 1927 nanometer handpiece and the 1550 nanometer handpiece to kind of break up the scar tissue to allow those melanocytes to repopulate the area and start making melanin, but we were seeing really amazing before and afters with people using phenol peel for idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis. Now this may not apply to all depigmenting diseases, like I would not use it in vitiligo. This was just for IDH or IGH, and I think that we may be seeing this more in the future, but this was something that was kind of new and exciting and a new indication for the phenol peel that I'd never seen before. One last indication for phenol was 
actually for earlobe rejuvenation. So a lot of people will have laser resurfacing, CO2, different treatments on the face, but then they have these little creased earlobes that are lacking volume and kind of look like little shriveled raisins. And it, the earlobes are always neglected. And so there was talk of using phenol peel just for like an earlobe rejuvenation, which was really fun and exciting. So that was a really fun talk as well. Then there was a whole lecture on AI used in dermatology. And there was one thing that I couldn't stop thinking about. So AI is exploding all over every aspect and every space of not only medicine, but just in general in the whole world. But I really want to just have you guys use caution because the things that set experts aside, meaning like people who are physicians or people who have a level of expertise with extra training in lasers or devices or cosmetics, or even people who have skincare lines, the fact that AI can kind of speak in scientific terms where people would have to like Google things and really understand them to try to market or write copy for certain skincare products and so forth. Now anyone pretty much can. So I hope that there's a way that we can kind of tease through the fake AI science that people are writing, that actually AI is writing, and the real derms and the real experts that can really shine on things like Q&As and Instagram Lives and YouTube Lives because we can just talk off the top of our head because this is in our brain. This is a language that we speak. We don't have to chat GPT it into a copy that we you know, can paste somewhere. So AI and dermatology is up and coming, but that may be a good or a bad thing. I'm not quite sure yet. And the last thing that was discussed at the meeting, of course, you have to discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly. With the good comes the bad, but sometimes we have to present our morbidity and mortality complications and things that we see on the outside, and that's not a fun lecture to go to, but it's important to keep up your continuous medical education and see what's actually going on in the world. So there were several cases and case reports of complications that had happened at MediSpas, and there was a physician from Mass General at Harvard Medical School who had presented a complication that was occurring in a medi spa in the Boston area. And of course, the thing that is sad for physicians is that we're the ones that get the referrals when things go wrong, when there is a vascular occlusion, when there's a potential blindness, when there's a potential really harmful complication from fillers. They're, well, the doctors can fix it. We're gonna do the procedures, but we're just gonna send it to the doctors if things go wrong. It was really disheartening because there was a patient who was treated at a medi spa, and I guess the highest credential for the person at this exam Medi spa was an esthetician's license, which I think in the state of Boston you need 100 hours of cosmetology school, which is much different than you know medical school, residency, internship, fellowship, and so forth. But they were sent in with a really uh, robust vascular occlusion of the central face. They contacted the Medi spa, and of course there was no answer. I think what happens is the patients just get abandoned when complications happen, and they get sent to the physician's office. And when we try to call the Medi spa or report them to the medical board, the medical board will say, "Well, this is." we can't do anything about it. Like, what do you want us to do? Because we don't have any jurisdiction over you know, people who don't even have licenses, like they don't have a medical license that we can take away or they don't have a medical license that we can regulate or have any ramifications or repercussions. So it is an escalating problem because as fillers and lasers become more and more mainstream, there's less and less qualified individuals to do that. The patient literally came in with like a handwritten note, like on a paper towel and they spelled like the products wrong or they said we gave, you know, hundred units of vitrace and, or they didn't even say hundred units. They said we gave hundred milligrams of vitrace or vitrace any physician knows isn't measured in milligrams, it's measured in cc's. It just was really disheartening. And then once one physician presented it, everybody kind of got up and was talking about, we were all talking about the complications that we're seeing. And for you guys as patients, I don't know how to protect you from you from that or protect you guys from that happening. All I can say is if you're gonna have a procedure done, I think the easiest thing to do is to say, if the complication were to happen, and you can ask your injector, your provider this, how would you reverse it? And if they can't answer that question, you should probably run out the door and seek treatment elsewhere because if anyone, any of us were asked, if you have a potential blindness from filler, how would you reverse it? Say it's tear trough filler. We would do a retrobulbar injection of hyaluronidase, we'd flood it. There's certain things that you do to manage a complication, but if someone doesn't know how to manage a complication, but they're doing the treatments that they wouldn't know how to manage if something went wrong, then that provider shouldn't be performing those treatments. I don't know what else to tell you guys, but it is becoming an increasing problem so much so that we're hearing it at our academic meetings. And the Board of Dermatology, the medical board, nobody really knows what to do because we're getting overwhelmed with these complications. So hopefully by following people like me on YouTube, you'll be educated and you'll make an informed decision on who you go to for these cosmetic procedures. So that was pretty much the take home points from the meeting. Drop a comment in the comment section and let me know what you want me to talk about next in my next video. And as always, I'm non-sponsored and always will be. Thank you guys so much for your support.